we have an incredible show lined up for you today. We're going to have a panel of parents talking about what not to do. So if you're alienated, estranged, disconnected, possibly erased from a child or grandchild's life or maybe another family member, we're going to share some of the mistakes we made and let you know what not to do so you do not have to go down the same path that we did. So stay tuned. What not to do is a really funny statement to make. And if you would have told me that I'd be recording a podcast episode on what not to do when I was struggling with parental alienation, estrangement, again, whatever word resonates with you. And I say this all the time. This is a big tent. This is for anyone that's struggling with a relationship with a child, grandchild or other family members. Everyone is welcome. And early on, if you would have told me that I'd be recording an episode about what not to do, I would have told you that I was doing everything pretty okay or, or right, I might even have said. I would have said, like, I'm trying to be the best man that I can be, and I'm showing up, and I'm a good guy, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. And uh, and today, you know, my perspective is different. I made a lot of mistakes. So recently, my middle daughter, who I haven't had contact with for about three years or so, reached out to me. And when I went back in the text chain from about three years earlier, I noticed that I'd been sending her information about parental alienation and telling her what parental alienation was. And my strategy was, is I wanted to educate her, let her know what was going on so she could come on to Team Lawrence. She would love me. She wouldn't leave me. I wouldn't feel all alone. And ultimately, I wouldn't be abandoned. So I was sharing information that I thought was useful. Three years of perspective, it's one of the things I'll tell you not to do. Do not share information with your kids or grandkids or, or other family members about parental alienation or some other kind of huge epiphany you've had. It's not going to be useful to try and make them see things your way at the time you're seeing things. They need to get to know you again. They need to build trust. And over time, they're going to ask questions or they're going to get their own help and do their own work. And what I'm learning is I'm not their higher power. I'm not omnipotent. They have their own lives, their own schedule, their own way of doing things. And they might never see things the same way as me. And that's awesome too. I just want to have a relationship from a place where I'm loving myself. And that gives me the opportunity to connect with them. And at the end of the show today, I'm going to share a really cool tool that I use all the time. It's pretty simple. It's called the pause. I'm going to let you know what the pause is, how long it lasts, and where's the best place to use it. And you're going to be able to take that pause and use it right after listening to the show. So let's get into the show. Welcome to the Family Disappeared Podcast. My name is Lawrence Joss, and today we're going to have a panel of parents that are going to be talking about what not to do if you're disconnected, estranged, alienated, or possibly erased from your kids or grandkids' lives, even from other family members, they're going to share some experiences that they've gone through that in retrospect, they most probably would have done something different. And the beauty of this is hopefully it can help you not make the same mistakes. So let's get right into it. And I'm going to have the ladies introduce themselves. So Renee, if you could please introduce yourselves and, and let us know a little bit about you, please. Thanks, Lawrence. My name is Renee. I am the alienated mom of two boys, ages 35 and 37, and four grandchildren. The alienation started over 25 years ago, and I have had the first phone contact in years just a few weeks ago. Thank you so much, Renee. And Georgette, could you please introduce yourself to the community? Sure. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, so my name is Georgette. I am um, currently an alienated mom from my 27-year-old. I also have a 25-year-old. I do have contact with my 21-year-old. Um, I also have uh, two stepchildren, which I have contact with, and uh, two grandchildren. Thank you so much, Georgette, and, and welcome to the show, ladies. And just to clarify for everyone out there, when we qualify as alienated parents, we're not saying anything negative about the children or the grown children or the young children or whatever they are. The kids aren't doing anything wrong. 
And when we express how long we've been alienated, we're just letting people know basically a timeline of our journey so you can relate to where we are. So the kids are out there doing the best they can and growing and thriving and doing whatever. And we're here just to talk about our part in the story and what we've tried and where we've created some kind of messes. By no means are we saying that the children or anyone else has done anything. We really wanted to share our journey of recovery. And also when we talk about maybe we haven't spoken to our kids for a year or five years or 10 years or, or a couple months, whatever the time frame is, that might seem scary initially, but the beauty of what we're doing here is we want to share best practices, educations, what not to do. So you don't have to one day identify with the same amount of time that we have. Because for me personally, I know if I would have practiced some different ideas or if I was more contained or more grounded, I wouldn't have created as much harm as I have created. So we're going to jump into a couple questions right now. When and how did you find like the term parental alienation? And I'm just guessing that's the best term to use right now because there's a lot of research and stuff out there. And the second part of that question would be is where were you in your life? What, what was going on when you found this out? So we're going to start with Georgette, please. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. I have to be honest, as I was walking through alienation over the last 12 years, I really didn't know what it was. All I knew was I was in an excessive amount of pain, wondering why I couldn't get my children to have a relationship. So I was spending a lot of time on the computer, looking, picking terms and words, trying to find relief um, from what I was observing. Um, and actually, um, uh, it's even hard for me to remember exactly how I found, uh, PAA. It, um, I think I discovered it probably online a year before I even decided to even go to a meeting, um, because I was afraid and wasn't sure what to expect. Then when I got into the Parental Alienation Anonymous, I started to uh, realize that what I was going through, this is right where I fit and right where I needed to be. And so I'm hearing that you were on the computer searching for solutions, not really knowing what to do, and you found PAA. And for anyone out there that's new to our community, PAA is Parental Alienation Anonymous, and it's a free 12-step support group that we all belong to. So when any of us mentions that, that's what we're talking about. And in PAA, you learn about the dynamics and some of the solutions and what's going on out in the world of parental alienation. And again, estrangement, erasure, disconnection. These are all words under a really, really big tent. So please grab what word resonates with you and don't leave because you don't necessarily resonate with the word. All the information is just really helpful and useful. So Renee, just uh, the same question to you. How did you find the definition of PA and what did your life look like at that moment? Uh, we were at a very exciting time in our life. We were getting ready to retire and sell our home. And I had kind of given up on looking for solutions because it had been such a long time that, you know, I couldn't stay in that pain forever. So I had made a decision to get on with my life as best I could. And I really believe it was some kind of divine intervention because I was walking by a television in my living room. I can picture it right now. And the word parental alienation jumped out at me. And I remember thinking, huh, I wonder what that is. That's interesting. I immediately Googled it, started seeing 12-step groups, saw um, specifically this group for parental alienation 12-step. And being a member of another 12-step program, I knew that this is exactly what I wanted. And I sent out the email, requested contact, and started going to meetings. That's been 18 months ago. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much. And for me personally, like the first eight, nine years of my journey, I never heard of the word parental alienation. So, and if you're just sharing that and just starting to to do research, I think you're you're very similar to all of us. It just took what it took for us to find something that made sense. And again, like the research in parental alienation and some of the key factors are really great to read about and uh, educate yourself about. And the word parental alienation itself, in my opinion, is divisive at some times and it needs to be used in the right situation and in the safety generally of a group of people that is struggling with the same thing. So we're going to jump into the next question here. 
So I just want to jump into something meaty right here in the beginning. So what not to do? Can you each give me one example of what not to do and maybe what happened because of what you did and, and what your two second perspective is now where you're sitting in your life? So Renee, I'm going to go with you first. What not to do? If I had to pick one thing that I did that I later in retrospect wish I hadn't done, uh, it was asking my kids about the other child. Rather than seeing them as individuals, seeing them as one unit. And since I if I did have an oppor- if I did have an opportunity to talk with one of them, one of the first things I would say is, So how's your brother doing? How are things going with him? Now in looking back, I recognize that that child most likely felt like, Well, you're talking to me. So maybe ask me how I'm doing. So that's one big thing that I would change. Wow, that's that's a, that's a really powerful, you know, revelation. And when you're asking the child about the other brother, yeah, it's making them maybe not feel seen and heard, and maybe disappear in them a little bit, right? That's what you're saying, Renee. Correct? That's exactly right. Yes, this whole pathology is crazy and confusing because we want connection and in wanting connection, sometimes we cause disconnection and we become part of the problem is definitely my experience and what I'm hearing from Renee. So Georgette, this the same question. Well, looking back now, I have to be honest that um, I spent a lot of time and put a lot of pressure on my kids um, by constantly chasing them. Um, I wore masks that I didn't realize I was wearing. Everything was happy. I'd, I'd chase them. I'd call them. I'd send text after text of I love yous, emojis. Um, what are you doing? Can we get together? Just constant chasing, um, and not giving the kids the freedom to meet me halfway in the relationship. I chased, I stumbled, and overdid my part of the relationship, and um, it was probably a lot of pressure for the kids, uh, something they probably weren't quite ready for, and I can see that now. So I'm hearing that it was it was overwhelming for their uh, emotional system and their nervous system, and basically it was what you were experiencing, and you were trying to create connection, but you're actually creating distance by kind of overwhelming them, correct? Absolutely. Um, the energy I was bringing to the situation was probably so overwhelming for them as they were dealing with their own, um, you know, just their own life situation and their own feelings uh, around uh, what happened to the relationship we had. So, yeah, it was probably way too much. Thank you, Georgette. And and for anyone out there that, again, is new to the show, there's always a link in the show notes that will get you uh, to the PAA meetings if you're looking support. If you're looking for support or you're just curious what they're about, there's a bunch of information down there and we'd love to have you come join our community. So we briefly touched on this about how and when you found PAA. So just to throw it out there to anyone new to the show, when you did find PAA and you landed up in a group and you were struggling with the kids, like what was a couple of early takeaways or early feelings that you felt in your body when, when you joined the community as you were struggling with everything? And uh, let's go to you first this time, Georgette. When I started going to the meetings and having some consistency, um, I tried to keep my mouth closed and just kind of listen to what was going on in the room. And there, the wisdom of the uh, members who had been there longer than me, the shares they had to offer during meetings, I started to take those things in and um, I started to feel myself calm down. I think it was the fact that I didn't feel so alone anymore. I felt um, the comfort of other people sharing the same kinds of feelings that I was going through. Maybe the stories were different and their experiences a little different, but yet we were, they were sharing some of the points in their journey with their kids that, that I was going through and what healing was, was looking like for people who were walking through the program and um, learning some of the, what we call tools um, in the 12 step program. Right. So I'm, I'm hearing like being in the rooms really helped you regulate your nervous system. Like you found a place where you could finally just take a big breath and exhale and just like, oh, oh, wow, 
I'm not alone, right? Absolutely. Pure relief. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Very beautiful. And Renee, you're up next. I'm going to say that the reaction that I had to the very first meeting was extremely healing because I'd been doing this on my own for 25 years. I'd had all of these years to beat myself up, wonder what was wrong with me, criticize myself, think that God must just hate me. I don't know. I must be a terrible person that my own children don't want a relationship with me. So when I went to my first meeting, there was a conversation about the fact that a big part of this was not our fault and was also not our children's fault. And that really resonated with me. And I literally felt a lightness of this heavy, heavy burden lifting off my shoulders for the first time in a couple decades. And it was profound. It was definitely a spiritual experience. And I'll never forget that feeling. And I knew right then I would be coming back. Wow. And struggling alone with, with this pathology and disease for 15, 20 years can definitely drive a person close to insanity. And I'm, I'm hearing that uh, you too got to take a breath, felt safe, felt like you had arrived at a place where you could actually stay and relax a while. Absolutely. So we're just going to like go back a little bit in our journeys and just kind of like check in. Like when you first started struggling with these dynamics in your, your family, like how were you feeling? What was going on and, and what tools were you using in your family at that time that might not have been very useful? And uh, let's go with you first, Renee. So back when I first started this journey, I had absolutely no idea what was happening. Um, there were a lot of other moving parts, a lot of marital problems uh, that came on suddenly. And in looking back, I recognize that I was not being an adult in the situation. I was sharing information with my six and seven year old boys about my personal life with my husband and why he was wrong. Um, and I think that did a lot of damage. Um, it was a very high conflict time. And um, I was so self-centered at that moment and in so much pain that I said things that I wish I would not have said. And, you know, once it's out there, you can't take it back. Yeah, that, that, that's very true. And you touched on a really important point is even us as parents that are finding us in the seat where we're disconnected from our kids had a part to play in the whole overall scheme or the landscape of parental alienation, estrangement, disconnection or what it is. And one of those things is sharing information with our kids that they didn't necessarily need to know. And the main strategy behind that is trying to get the kids to love us, not to leave us not to abandon us. And we're just struggling and grasping at different straws, trying for that not to happen. And unfortunately, when we do that, we're actually creating more distance. We're creating more discord and we're actually putting a lot of pressure on the kids to be a certain way and them to save and fix us, which is not their job. We are the parents. And is there anything else you want to add to that little bit, Renee, that might've popped up as I'm saying that? You know, just that uh, I did the best I could at the time with what I had. Um, I think that's a really important point that, you know, we've already been beat up enough, usually by ourselves, and um, we did the best we could. But once we know that there's another way, then we can start making better decisions. And um, another big point for me that I mentioned briefly before was that it wasn't my children's fault. And, you know, up until PAA, I really believed that I was an innocent victim that had done absolutely nothing wrong. And I was very angry at my children. Like, how can they, they're adults now, how can they not see that I love them? But what I recognize today is they're still thinking with those little six and seven year old brains about this situation, even though they're in their 30s today. So, um, a lot of my perspective was changed very early on by PAA meetings. Thank you, Renee. Thank you so much. And Georgette, the same question for you. Um, even sitting here uh, today, uh, having Renee, it, it awakens some things uh, 
that I'm taking a look at, that I contributed to things in my family I couldn't see until I have been in the program and I have clarity or better clarity. My home with my family at the time, it was a very tumultuous time. And um, I think for years, uh, my husband and I parented and communicated from a different uh, experience in our own families. I brought to the table childhood baggage as as well as my uh, ex-husband did. And my kids were left to function in that. With us going through our dysfunction, they were just taken along for the ride. I had my own pain that was coming up, just triggered in my own marriage. And yeah, it wasn't my children's fault. And they got taken down a road. They watched the devastation of their family fall apart. The clarity definitely has come even in the even over the past months of being in PAA. Um, you get to have a really good look at uh, where your place in this, where my place is, in in why I'm in the situation I'm in today. Um, and yes, the fact that my kids, who are young adults, um, they are functioning in their pain. Um, from a place where they're just that small child who was walking through that at the time. Well, that's, that's powerful stuff. I can feel like some tingles in my arms and I feel some like emotions in my eyes and in my chest. Like it's, it's a lot to listen to and to feel. And at the same time, it's like this incredibly spacious and creative space to show up differently in your kids' lives, in your grandkids' lives, in other family members' lives. And that's a lot of what we're talking about. We're really flipping the script. A lot of folks that are struggling with this are perpetuating a lot of damage because they don't know that there's a different option. And we keep talking about PAA and Parental Alienation Anonymous. And the neat thing about the framework is it gives you recovery tools. It's not about focusing on your ex or necessarily even focusing on the child. It's actually turning the mirror back to you and working on your emotional and spiritual ecosystem. So when you do go out and have relationships that you can come from a different place, you can come from an integrated place, not from this place where we're bringing transgenerational family trauma or family system stuff from our original family. And when I say that, those words might sound confusing, but this is just behaviors that we've learned in our family. This is how our, our family has spoken to each other over time. Maybe we talk at each other instead of to each other. And then we go out and start our families and we bring these to our kids and we start teaching them some of these behaviors that aren't fully developed and stuff we're still working through as adults. So again, the Parental Alienation Anonymous community is a recovery-based community. It's really worth checking out if you're struggling. And there might be another support group that's great for you too. This is just a suggestion, not something that anyone needs to do. So let's jump into the next question. Ooh, there's a good one. Boundaries. So what did boundaries look like in your family when you were just in the the, the beginning parts of divorce or separation or whatever your story was? And what does a boundary look like for you today? And if you can just compare what they look like and what they look like now and what the effect was on the kids. And Georgette, let's let's start you off with the boundaries. Boundaries is a huge um, skill that I probably have just learned over the past year. So I'm like a baby. Um, I'm I'm still learning how to have boundaries. Um, I'm learning how to feel comfortable with boundaries. So for me, and I never had boundaries. I'm pretty sure that I was the yes, ma'am. You needed something. I'm going to do it. Everything's fine. I got it. It didn't matter if I was falling apart inside. I didn't know how to honor myself and say, I need a minute. Let me think about it. I'm not sure. I'll get back to you. I'll let you know. I didn't have strong boundaries with my children as to how it was appropriate for me to be treated. This might sound funny, but for me, after being in the program for probably five months and I started experimenting with what having a boundary for myself looked like, it really put off my children um, I, I noticed other people weren't real comfortable with me having boundaries of setting t a limit 
on what I was um, able to accommodate, especially for myself healing and going through a lot of emotional healing, I had to make decisions whether I could be involved in certain conversations at particular times. And that really was new for me and very uncomfortable. Boundaries, it makes me feel inside of myself. I'm still nervous trying to have them because it's so foreign to me. But learning how necessary and freeing that I, that I have, I, I think of it as having a voice for myself. I'm honoring what what works for me. So that's where I'm at with boundaries. I'm still in the infant stage of learning. So. so what I'm hearing is in your family of origin, which would have been your parents and your siblings and anyone else that was in the house, there wasn't necessarily any boundaries. So you grew up without knowing what a boundary was. You would always just show up and say yes and, and do stuff because that's what you thought the right thing was to do. And that's what you also role modeled for your kids. And now that you're in emotional and spiritual recovery and looking at yourself, like you're starting to establish boundaries and they still feel really uncomfortable and and you feel kind of like a a baby waddling around and trying to figure out how to walk, correct? Yeah, it's, I'll be honest, it's very uncomfortable because it's a skill. I'm an adult and it's very hard to integrate that into your adult life when, you know, after all these years, but I I am finding relief in having boundaries and I'm seeing how useful it is. However, I have trained people around me, my kiddos, I've trained them as to who I've been all these years. So I imagine, um, I think to myself, how scary it must be for them too. They're dealing with a new mom and a sturdier version of a mom, but not so easy to you know, push around. So yeah, it's definitely, it's going to take time to strengthen that. Mm, Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Georgette. And Renee on boundaries, what, what do you have to share with us? Oh my gosh, this is a complex question and a complex answer. Um, in my family of origin, we had some boundaries, like there are certain things you don't do. You do not talk back to your parents. You do not do this. You don't drink. You don't smoke, blah, blah, right? But then with the behavioral things in the family, there was a big lack of boundaries. You know, mom is sharing things about my dad with me that were not appropriate to share with a teenage daughter, right? So all of those things from my family of origin, of course, I bring into my marriage. And everything that's happening in my marriage and with my children, and especially during that very volatile divorce controversy, I'm sharing everything with my parents, and then it's being shared with someone else. And there were no boundaries about what's appropriate to share with people and what's not. And over my years of recovery in various 12-step programs, boundaries have been a big, big part of my recovery. And one of the terms I heard early on was it's so important to set boundaries. However, we don't want them to be hatchet boundaries. Like if we haven't been setting boundaries and all of a sudden we come in and when we set a boundary, it lops their head off. You know, it's a very hard and firm and okay. And the person is reeling when we do that. So what I've learned in my recovery is that I start out with some gentle boundaries, you know, rather than you can't talk to me like that. It's more like, you know what, it really hurts my feelings when you talk to me that way. And I just need to let you know that. And then if they still don't hear me, maybe I take it up a notch and then maybe up another notch. And if it's going to get out of control, maybe I stop the conversation altogether. Um, So boundaries have been extremely useful for me in a lot of different arenas. Like, If someone's calling me, I don't have to pick up that phone. If I'm not in a good place to have that conversation or whatever reason that I need to set a boundary, I'm not going to have this conversation right now. I can revisit it later. Or as was said earlier by Georgette, I can say to someone, you know what, let me take a minute to check my schedule and I'll get right back to you. 
And this has only come over years and years and years of not having boundaries. And as Georgette alluded to earlier, letting you do whatever with me, like you need me to do this, do that, even though I'm overloaded, I'm more than happy to do that for you. And PAA has completely changed my life in terms of really shoring up my boundaries and my self-care. So much beautiful stuff in there, Renee. And I must say the hatchet boundaries definitely got a chuckle from me. And this is such an important point that you made. In our family of origin, with our kids and really, really close family members, as we start to establish boundaries, and Georgette touched on this too briefly, is that it can be jarring. Like people don't know how to receive that. Like it's always been yes and no one else in the family has boundaries. And as you start to have boundaries, it's kind of like this reverb and everyone goes into like a contraction because they don't know what to do with you saying, hey, I'm going to have to get back to you in five minutes or no, no, I'm not going to take out the trash. Well, whatever the point will be, like people's nervous systems have been trained in a particular way, especially our kids and other family members and close friends. And their nervous system is used to you reacting in a specific kind of way. And once you start to change that, naturally, there's going to be some pushback. And um, Renee also mentioned some really interesting stuff about like the family of origin and then like these hard no's. And I just want to share something for me early on when I started working with boundaries, because I had no idea what they were. I was really confused between a boundary and a wall. And I'd spend some time with a good friend of mine. I said, I'm putting up this boundary. And she's like, you don't put up boundaries. You have boundaries. You put up walls. And she was very clear to say boundaries are pliable, movable, and negotiable right? A wall isn't movable. There's no way to get around it. It's really, really, really hard. So this is a really important distinction when you're working with your kids or working with other people, work wherever you are, like a boundary needs to be pliable and negotiable. If you're just reacting from pain and hurt and just trying to make someone stop, that might not necessarily be a boundary. That might be a wall. And for me personally, I see my children putting up walls sometimes because I taught them that's what a boundary was. So there was a, a lot of information today in the show. We talked about boundaries, what a boundary looks like, what's the difference between a boundary and a wall. We talked about trying to regulate ourselves with, uh, with our children's nervous system or someone else's nervous system when we're really needy and, and we really can't get into our own bodies. We're reaching for something outside of ourselves and we talk about what kind of harm that could cause. We also talk about how our relationships are changing and evolving and what it looks like using recovery tools and skills to change the dynamics of how we show up in different relationships. And most importantly, we talk about what not to do. We talk about some of the things we've done that have not been useful and hopefully you won't do them too and you won't have to experience some of these extreme cases of time and hurt and, and pain and suffering that we have. You do not want to miss our next episode. We have Dr. Lynn Steinberg on the show, and she's going to be talking specifically about representing yourself pro se. And pro se means if you go into court and you don't have the financial means to represent yourself, what it looks like to represent yourself in court, and what are some best practices to get through that. And Dr. Steinberg has actually just written a book on this, so there'll be plenty of reference materials and other ideas on what the best practices is, and there'll be plenty of other information, how to show up in court, how not to irritate the judge, how to come in from a place that is grounded and organized, and I'm going to be sharing a really great origin story with uh, how Dr. Steinberg and I met, so please, please, please show up. So as a reminder, there's a link in the show notes to PAA, Parental Alienation Anonymous, which again is a free support group. There's a link to NVC, which is Nonviolent Communication, and we've spoken about this in previous episodes, and there will be an episode coming up that just concentrates on communication. There will also be a link to meditation, which is a great way to get into your body. It's a great way to ground yourself so when you're out there practicing relationships, you're coming from a place of uh, embodiment. There will also be a link in the show notes to the Family Hope Project, which is an advocacy platform to educate people about estrangement, alienation, erasure, disconnection. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful contributions on there, and we need your artwork and your story to make this more robust and more accessible to more people around the world. So please click on that and, and participate. And lastly, there will be a link to fundraising. 
for um, PAA. It's 100% free, all the services, everything that come out of it's free. And if you want to participate and keep it available for more and more people for the days, years, and months to come, please, please, please uh, take a moment to contribute to that. And lastly, share this. Share it on social media. Share it with your friends. Please let anyone know that this might be useful to that, that it's available and accessible to people. And uh, again, my emails in, in the show notes, send questions, comments. Let us know what you want us to talk about, what you want to hear, what you're struggling with, and and hopefully we can uh, create some shows to help support you. So again, thanks for coming out. Happy days to all, and we will see you same place, same time next week.